So, uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, so I'm gonna start this conversation in a very particular way, which is to sort of, I'm gonna run a hypothesis with you about what I think is transforming in architecture and what is transforming architecture over the next few years and urbanism. And we can perhaps have a discussion near, near the end about actually what some of these implications are. And I wanna to propose to you that, that the kind of typical thesis, whether it's form follows function or form follows finance, is that form follows the code of capital. So it is how you code and structure things that is actually organizing our cities in really strategic ways. And if you want to change the nature of that, you have to change the nature of how we regulate and govern. So how many of you know about property rights, right? Who here has studied property rights? Right? Now, I think property rights are a really profound thing. They're an idea. They're an idea of ownership, right? Where does this idea of ownership come from? Why is it a relevant idea of organizing cities? Why should it be a relevant idea of organizing cities? When was it enacted? Is it viable into the future? Is it not viable into the future? These are all questions that are open for debate. They are non-fixed questions. And our thesis of how we've organized the world around us has been through understanding these rights in a very particular format. Now, if you look back in history, these rights were, I'm gonna use sort of a bit of a thesis and story, is that these were rights were given by kings and queens to barons to be able to extract the resources of a land, the right to take extra, right to extract resources, whether they be taxes, minerals, and other things from the land to the person the king or queen has allocated capital to. There were mechanisms. Now, this, these mechanisms aren't the only way of organizing the world. So if you go to indigenous communities, if you go to First Nations, they organize in a different way. They organize through treaty in relationship to the land. And one of the things that I think is changing and is going to change is the nature of the way we organize, and it's the boring bits, the bureaucracy. The reason why property rights exist is because we were able to organize and register property in a very particular format. And the efficiency of doing that was the mechanism that gave birth to property rights. Property rights are a bundle of rights. Like if you read contract law, they're a bundle of rights. If you want to reinvent cities, and I think this is what, what I'm gonna open up, actually reinventing things like property rights are gonna be fundamental to opening up the conversation. So that's a hypothesis I'm gonna give you. Then I'm gonna sort of backtrack and work, your way, work our way through it. A little bit about us, I don't really tend to do this a lot. Um, so we're, uh, we're a team by the name of Dark Matter Labs and I'll explain why. We're about, uh, we're now, well, so nearly 30 people around the world. Um, we are a full-time team operating uh, from Seoul to many, many other places. We have slightly uniquely amongst us data scientists, facilitators to full stack coders, to researchers and designers. We have a quite a different form of team. I, it's part of something that I built with David Saxby uh, called an organization called Zero Zero. We were part of building WikiHouse, open source housing, OpenDesk, open source furniture company, which you can download and print to impact hubs to architecture Zero Zero, and part of the portfolio is Studio Weave from JO. So sort of part of something that's kind of been, we like to build things as well as build prototypes in different formats. Um, this is something, some of the stuff we did in WikiHouse. This is some of the stuff with OpenDesk. OpenDesk is kind of one of the first printed furniture that's hosted at MoMA and various other places in the world. However, in about 2014-15, we started to realize that underneath the WikiHouse and OpenDesk, there were a bunch of structural questions. If you wanted to do open source design and you wanted to look at how you did quality control in open source design, 
you would have to reinvent how you do warranties. And without reinventing warranties, you wouldn't be able to do open source design if you wanted to trade it. So if I wanted to sell uh, a piece of open source furniture to someone, a corporation, I would have to reimagine how I did warranties because I'd have to warranty the product. And historically, what happens is you centralize warranties. When you centralize warranties, you centralize innovation. If you want to decentralize innovation in open source design, you have to reimagine how you underwrite the quality assurance process. This is the boring stuff that we don't tend to like to do, but when you try to do any of these products, any of these open source products, these are the things that drive centralization. These are the things that draw, that stop many of these things happening. So open source housing, WikiHouse. 36 chapters around the world, lots of people building it. But the real question was, if you wanted to borrow money, i.e. to build a mortgage, you had to be able to build some idea of quality assurance. So if everyone's taking a design, you can download the design yourself and 3D print it yourself and build it in less than sort of four weeks. But the real question was, if you were gonna do it, how would you warranty this product? So what we started to realize was underneath all the cool products that we as architects and designers wanted to build, there was a whole bunch of structural questions that we were not engaging with and they were not being reinvented. So we built something called dark matter and that's really been sort of some of our focus and I'll talk about why I think that's critical in, a, in the next part of the story. Now, here's where I want to take a sort of a bit of a pause and come back in, into this properly. So, what you see in front of you is is a temperature anomalies by country since 18, 1880 to 2017. Uh, and what you see is the scale of those anomalies. Now, what you should all be thinking is what does that really mean? Well, climate change is not something into the future. Many of you are talking about it. Hopefully many of you are part of this conversation. But the scale of change we're about to witness in the nature of civilization is of an order of magnitude and where we are is that it's life terminating, civilization terminating. So the likelihood is where currently all policies are driving us to four degrees centigrade minimum. If we enact all our good policies, life terminates and civilization terminates at about 2.5, 2.7 degrees. After that, most of our current mechanisms don't work. Our bread baskets are likely to fail much earlier than that. Our global five big bread market, uh, bread, bread baskets in the world are likely to fail well earlier than that. So when we start to talk about this stuff, we have to understand the scale of the transition we're under. Too often, people, when they're talking about climate change, I'm going to talk a little bit about this and I'll tell you why in a second. They talk about building retrofits. They talk about mobility. It is utter, utter bollocks. <laughs> I cannot say this more cleanly and clearly enough. And the reason why it's utter, utter bollocks is that the reality is what you produce, what you consume, what food you eat, where you produce it, these chains are about to be disrupted. The retrofitting of buildings is a small component in the thesis of the city. So I'll give you a very practical example. Milan, as a city, is looking to, uh, is looking to reduce car miles traveled by 50% as part of its strategy of getting to near climate, uh, to 75% reduction. 50% so reduction in car miles traveled. 50% reduction in car miles traveled fundamentally changes the economic geography of your city. It is no longer going to function the way it did and uh, uh, does now. So when we start to look at this transition, this is a fundamental transition of how we live and work. Phase one. Now, here's a key point. Climate change is a symptom of the problem. Symptom. Why? And the reason why it's a symptom is that there are many other strategic issues that are terminating humanity whether it's the loss of biodiversity, the pollution in our water systems, or whether it's levels of air pollution that we're driving, there are a whole system of issues that are terminating civil, a human civilization. So when we talk about climate change, 
we have to be really careful that we're not just addressing the symptoms, but going at the underlying issues. Now, when you get to the underlying issues, you start to have to think differently. So the challenge of climate change, I would argue, is not climate change, but the nature of how we've organized our economy in driving externalities, right? So you can have a system where externalities can be generated and they're uncosted or unaccounted in the system. CO2 can be pumped out without it being priced. Biodiversity can be undermined without it being priced or understood. Plastics can be poured into the ocean without it being understood. A whale, in, a, a whale which is pulled out of the water is worth a million dollars, right? That's how much it's worth if you sell that whale. But a whale that's building an ecosystem, which is incredibly valuable in terms of CO2 absorption and other things, is, less than, is worth less than 50,000. So the extractive value of it is much higher than the ecosystem value of it. And that's about how we've understood these value, value mechanisms. So there's something going on here that underneath climate change is there's a structural issue how we've organized our economy. And I think that's really important as us, as architects, to understand what the structural issues are. Because the hypothesis is when those structural issues change, the nature of how we organize in the world fundamentally changes and what we operationalize. And this is manifest in multiple formats. So if you want to talk and look at the biodiversity issues that we have, well, this is a very pertinent piece of kind of fact, right? So 96% of mammals on the earth, right? Livestock and humans are livestock and humans. 4% are wild animals. 4%. That's your zebras, that's your lions, all of that stuff, it's 4%. So when we talk about our built environment or our environment, what does that mean when we talk about elephants being, you know, elephants and all these things that we glorify in beautiful video magazines are less than 4%. And that destruction has happened, much of that destruction has happened since the 1970s in a very short period of time in terms of human history. At the same time, I think one of the things that we also have to understand is the fundamental nature of our economy and the mechanisms of our economy have changed. And these are really important for us to understand. So historically, our economy has been constructed around tangible goods, chairs, other things, right? tangible things. Increasingly, our economy is built around intangible goods, i.e., what is the value of uh, the AA as a brand? Right? Many of you came here for the value of that brand and the value of that association with that thing. But you also came here for the lectures and the discussions, but you also came here for the brand. That brand has a value. Right? Now, if the AA was to fail, what would be the value of that brand? Whereas the chairs could be sold on the secondary market. Tangible assets and intangible assets have a fundamentally different quality. Intangible assets are non-tradable, sunk, highly synergistic, and they open up different, they can't be held, held or controlled. Whereas tangible assets are tradable and transferable. Now why that's important is this. Increasingly our economies have moved towards intangible assets. That transfer to intangible assets means that place has become more important. Place has become more important because intangible assets create spillover value, not transaction value, tradable value. And that, economy, that has happened pretty consistently. The UK is the most intangible rich economy in the world. Now why that's important is this. Over that same period, land has become one of the most fundamental rent-seeking mechanisms out there. So if you wanted, for all the talk of tech unicorns, all the talk of kind of big financial houses, if you wanted to make money, where would you have put, put your money? Be land. Land, this is the net UK wealth, right? Land has been the thing that has stored value. And 
increasingly in an intangibles economy, land becomes the rent-seeking mechanism of an intangibles economy, because you can't buy and trade it for equity and other mechanisms. So this is really subtle, but it's important to understand what's happening to our cities and our world around us. At the same time, we are in the midst of an automation challenge. Now, it's not clearly obvious why I say that, but I'm gonna communicate that. So, Uber did not destroy the taxi driver, right? Not yet, eventually maybe. But what did Uber destroy? The taxi office, right? It destroyed the taxi office. Now, why that's important is that what you see technology doing is disintermediating the middle. Everyone thinks automation is about the front line. Actually, it's about the removal of management. So if you want to talk about the future of cities, you have to talk not about post-industrial cities, you have to talk about post-managerial cities. Now, why that's important is that most of our cities are focused on management-driven processes. If you go to a brilliant organization called Bertzerger, a neighborhood care company, it does neighborhood-level nurses, neighborhood, like co-ops of neighborhoods, right? co-ops of nurses. What that's interesting about them is they have 18,000 nurses. How many people do you think you have in headquarters? less than 150. So what you're seeing, if you want to think about cities, is what you're seeing is the headquarters shrink to nothing. Cooperatives being distributed all the, over the city and the managerial class being vacillated. Now why is that important? Two things, the wages of nurses all went up in that process. The nurses went from being stage two accredited to stage three. They had more power, more freedom. The, 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 the central organization became a platform for learning. So management or senior management became a platform for learning and innovation was front loaded. So it's not bad. But what it does mean is your middle classes are being stripped out in the classic format. Now, look back at history. 1800s to 1840s, there was a period called the Engels Pause. In the period of the Engels Pause, wages for human labor flatlined and declined. So the wages that, that labor was earning was flatlining and declining, whereas wages for capital goods, so which is machinery and other things, the return on capital was going up. We are almost exactly in the same period where middle class wages are declining or holding steady, and the return on capital is going up. Now, why I say that is that it's really important to then start to talk about what does a city look like, because I would argue most of our cities are still being designed from a thesis of management. So what does that future look like is gonna be really critical. And the reason why I bring these things together is that as designers, I think one of the strategic objectives and challenges that you face is over the next 10 years, these problems are not going to come at you one at a time. They're going to come at you through an integrated lens. How does automation deal with decarbonization, deal with human development in fundamentally different formats? And what does the future of the city look like? And I'm gonna, um, so the slight privilege of sitting here, so I want you, to, I would like you to challenge all the thesis that you hear about the city. As a minor provocation, I would say our analysis of the city, the urban renaissance analysis of dense urban cities, is a false analysis of the future of the city. I do not believe the future of the city will follow the same pattern. Why is really worth recognizing some really hard points here. If you want to look at the modern city, it is also as a function of antibacterial, um, uh, sort of antibacterial drugs. You want to see the modern city? It's a function of our antibiotic capabilities. You get rid of those, you start to undermine the function form of cities. You want to look at actually other issues, whether it's human development. So our current city, you guys all know this intuitively, 
our current city is focused, if you look at, is focused on coffee culture, it's focused on, on uh, serendipity, but if you want to do complex, deep work, where do you guys go? Right, it's difficult. So we know, here's some things, schizophrenia in cities is twice as high as in rural environments. We know air pollution takes out about a year's worth of cognitive performance of children. We know night, uh, so light pollution destroys your sleep patterns and impacts your cognitive capabilities the next day. We know sound pollution, persistent sound pollution, so you know the noise of cars in the background when you're sleeping? That minor levels of stress drives stress into your cortisone, into your bloodstream, which takes out years of your life. So people living on roads tend to die quicker. So when you look at it from a fine-grained idea of human development and cognitive performance, you start to recognize the modern city form may be actually fundamentally anti-human in terms of the value of human contribution. It is perfectly optimized to optimize the value of real estate. But is it optimized for the value of being human? So typically, real estate, and again, my, I train as an architect, guys, and so we operate as architects, but I want you to know this stuff. This is one of my one old frustrations is architects are undereducated about the kind of underlying factors that drive decision making. So real estate is about 10% of the cost of an organization, 10% paying rent for buildings, right? The cost of people for an organization is, come on, some hands, some some thoughts. 10% is relocated, real estate costs. What's the cost of people? Not far, it's about 60%, 50 to 60%. So the people, pay, pay, paying people's wages and costs is 50% of an organization, if not slightly higher. Yet all of our real estate strategies, and you see it here as much as anywhere else, are focused on optimizing what? The real estate, not on people. That's because the business model real estate is focused on how much real estate you sell. And what we've been so, so co-working for example, which you know, we were part of building some of the original co-working spaces, but co-working as such, what do you think the benefits of co-working are? Precisely. There is, so a lot of people would assume it's about communication. So a traditional architectural pitch would be, there will be serendipity, people will cross over, people will talk more, they will have, what's it called, water cooler moments. Right? That's the typical pitch. And you've probably been either part of it, and you know we can all chat because we're sitting and looking at each other. How about if I told you that any of the research that's been done says, that actually in open plan working spaces and co-working spaces, communication goes down. So what you start to realize is that the optimization of, so we are optimizing real estate at the losses of human capital and human development. So the questions that start to come to the table is what do these futures look like? If you want to reinvent architecture, you guys design buildings, and many of you passively design buildings on the idea of optimizing human development. Whichever form you, you do it through art, culture, whatever, there's an idea, a passive idea, about optimizing that. But the question is, do you know the deep codes that are driving actually the exact opposite of it? And I would argue that the current thesis of the city has been all about optimizing real estate not necessarily optimizing human development. Now, this is where it gets interesting. In a future where high performance cognitive emotional capabilities, high performance emotional cognitive capabilities are the gold of the future economy, right? So if you wanna have the society of the future, you want to have the highest performance cognitive emotional capabilities, right? That's, everything else is commodity. How would you build your cities? So in Stockholm region, we're working with the region of Stockholm who's asking that exact question. 
So if you believe that humans are a foundational gold, how would you think about the city? Would it be low noise, low night pollution? Would it be reflective spaces? Would it be empty courtyards, which don't actually have any transactions? Because actually it's perfectly fine to sit there reflectively. Because the value you're transacting is not in the coffee shop that makes a bit of money. The value you're transacting is the cognitive capability of the whole city operationalizing in a different format. So what, what I'm suggesting there is that where do you operationalize value? Do you operationalize it in the selling of the coffee shop and the serendipity of that? Or do you operationalize it in the selling of reflective space and the high performance cognitive capabilities of that? So why this is important is that these decisions manifest in our architecture and you passively draw them in. You passively draw in the coffee shop. You passively draw in the rhetoric of this stuff because it's coded into a thesis of urbanism. Challenge it. I'm not saying what I'm saying is right. I'm just saying, and I'm genuinely not saying that, but what I'm saying is it's, oh, it has a code, it has a particular logic which needs and should be challenged. So when you look at this transition, over the next 10 years, I think we will see a foundational transition of our cities in a way that we've not seen before. Both in terms of logistics, both in terms of human development, both in term, and also in terms of actually the fundamental uh, sort of decarbonization of those cities and what the implications are. And there's lots of different things behind that. The other thing I want to sort of develop here with you is, is a more structural thesis, which is around what we think of as mechanisms of change. This is a map of obesity and all the drivers and the actors behind obesity done by the UK Cabinet Office. Now why I bring that forward is that passively, as architects and designers and social designers, many people have fallen into the trap of looking at problem cause. This is the problem, this is the solution. You know, I've got obesity, get rid of sugar tax, and I've solved the problem. How do you design change in that world? If your world is full of multiple factors, so how many of you know about obesogenic environments? Obesogenic environments are environments that bias the, the obesity in, in, in the population. Bias obesity, right? That's one aspect of the system. So what biases exist in the physical environment? What biases exist in the food groups and where they're located? What biases exist in people's psychological well-being? So how many of you know this, right? In recessions, what are you typically likely to buy? You're typically likely to buy in economic recessions. You're typically likely to buy emotional fixes. You buy emotional fixes in the moment of economic stress, or stress actually. Chocolate goes up, hairdressing goes up, cheap clothes goes up. Because when you're under financial stress, or any form of stress, you buy certain things that s s solve the problem. You're not making rational decisions in the classic Cartesian rational format. You solve the psychological issue, which is your foundation stone for being well. So what does biasing look like in a space when you put people under economic stress? When you put people under economic stress, you create biases in the systems. What does design change look like when all these biases, behavioral biases, choice biases, exist in the system and there isn't symmetry of power? That's the other thing. So free markets are a great thing. I genuinely believe that. But actually, when free market, most places are not free markets. They are free feudalisms. They're about the, they are not about symmetry of power. They are not about symmetry of, of relationships. So if the bias of most people, so if you're, so for example, I'll give you a really practical example. You're, uh, this is a real case study. A mother, this is done by some friends of ours, a really lovely piece of case study, where they, there was a woman who was um, buying Kentucky Fried Chicken for her children every day after school. 
right? And they were like, why is she doing this? Right? She's, she was super cognizant, not a, like, she was super cognizant. And when they did the case study, this is what they found. They found, well, she was working two jobs. She would work till the children were being picked up. She would go and pick up her children, and she had an hour to pick up, pick up with them and spend time with them. So what she realized was the best thing she could do was to have an hour of quality time, near as possible, from the school en route, and that was a place where she could have an hour's worth of time with them before she went to her second job. So in, the li in her life, in the theory of her life, that was a rational decision, right? A rational emotional decision. It was a fully cognizant decision. But the fact is you create biases in those environments that if the only option is Kentucky Fried Chicken that provides that space, then you have created a bias to her life, right? So how do you design change in that theory? Here's my provocation to architecture schools part of this. How many of you know about behavioral economics? How many of you look at biases, spatial biases? How many of you know about econometrics? So these things are important <laughs> because they are the tools that are being looked at to understand the city. Right? So I've talked to you about topics, right? But if I was to talk to you, how many know about Bernard Chumi, you'd all put your hand up. But you're missing whole fields of information that actually are the basis of how we understand cities. Right? So, this is, so I think the challenge that we have as designers, and I, there's a subtle provocation here, so I have the, it's an intimate audience so we can just talk. The, the role of architecture and urbanism and place-based design is not about the form. It is about the place. You are designing places, not buildings. And if you're designing places, your ability to deal with complexity and organizing complexity or what your mechanisms for driving change into complexity and what is your legitimacy to doing that is all open to question. Right? I'm not even saying you're legitimate to do that yet. How do you construct that is really important. And this applies to everything, right? So, um, for example, how many, how many times do you hear politicians say, we're gonna improve housing, housing stock, <laughs> and we're gonna make more houses? And how many times do you hear architects saying, we built a 50,000 pound house? This is my innovation. My contribution to architecture is I've built a smaller house. You hear it, right, all the time. Do we actually think that's a solution? So the problem of housing, if you look at it deeply enough, isn't about supply and demand of housing. It really isn't. It's, a, it's actually about the supply of, of, um, of uh, uh, debt facilities. It's our supply of cheap money into buying mortgages, which is inflated housing. And there is no incentive. We cannot deflate the value of housing, because if we did, our banks would fail. So every time a politician tells you, yes, we're going to look, no, they're not. They can't. Simultaneously, actually what we do know is that you, there's no incentive for the developers to build more housing because actually they can earn money by just building enough underneath the demand to keep prices going up because their land value is appreciating. This is a, is a lock-in. So often people talk about this as, oh, it's just, it's just the market. It's not. It's designed free feudalism. Markets can work. And there's an interesting question whether ha land markets are actually even possible, which I think is another conversation that we should all have. Is it even possible to have a land market because they're natural monopolies in themselves? So I know my f the people that were involved in our unit last year will know some of this, but I would really recommend the rest of you read stuff like Radical Markets. How many of you read Radical Markets? 
So let's, and Henry George and all the stuff around that, because if you're going to be cognizant about actually our built environment, you're going to have to be cognizant about those underlying forces. And this applies to many, many other things as well. So I'm going to, so one of the theses I want to put forward to you is designers, it is important that you consider yourself working diagonally. What makes you really interesting is that you can work from policy all the way to services. So as historically, most architects say, I'm the interface between the guys that really know everything about windows and the guys that really know everything about carpets to know everything about HVAC systems. You are also can be the interface designer diagonally across multiple other fields. The role of the architect is to design across disciplines. You will never, ever know anything enough about real envelope design. Right? There will be envelope engineers who will do it all for you. So the reality is your skill is the synthesis across multiple disciplines. And what I'm suggesting to you is that those disciplines are not the engineer and are not the structural engineer. They're actually a whole bunch of other disciplines where value is created. And I, this, again, I'm going to give you my lent on this a little bit, is that too much of architecture got focused on optimizing construction and insufficiently focused on actually the value proposition position of place in its fundamental sense. And so what you've, there's been is a passive bias towards optimizing buildings, and then some reactionary stuff about the buildings are no are outside that domain in some reactionary stuff, but nowhere near have you built the knowledge or capabilities to go diagonally around that change. How many of you know about urban policy? What do you know about urban policy? you know about the theory of urban policy and why it's been developing. Like, and the reason I ask this question is not to make anyone feel stupid. I'm asking these questions largely from the perspective of what you should be demanding to be able to be the people that we need in the world. Right? So the reason why in our organization we have researchers, we have think tanks, is because we recognize to build design places you need diagonal skills. And those diagonal skills are really critical. This applies to the system stuff applies to many, many things. And one of the other things that we realized very quickly is that when you're looking at complex change is you need a portfolio of interventions. And I'll talk more about this later. But there is the theory that, that one intervention, you know, and solves a problem is not real. And the system stuff we're doing in Birmingham around uh, radical childcare with IMI Core, which is looking at how do we drive system level change in a place and what the implications are. So I'm going to, so having spoken about this, one of the things I want to take us back to is that if you look at the scale of the challenges that we're facing, one of the underlying problems is that actually we're responding to very particular types of change, whether it's CO2, molecular, sort of actually kind of micro level change. It's a war of molecules. It's non-linear. The effects of it are not linear. So we've known that CO2 levels are going up and now they're going to feed back into the system. It's largely invisible. Right. And there are microbacterial threats and other things. So what we're seeing is a different type of issues come to the table. And those issues require different types of institutions. And one of the hypotheses is that these require us to look at the deep codes of design. So if you look at destruction of uh, common resources or future liabilities, and you look at the, the impacts of these things, whether it's heat island effects. So just to give you an example, if we go up one and a half degrees centigrade, most of our cities will be going up between three and a half to four degrees centigrade. Paris was already at 50 degrees last year, right? So when you talk about this stuff, let's also recognize the scale of the risk on the table. And over 50 degrees, just to be really blunt about this, is life-threatening, right? There is, it's just life-threatening. So we know parts of India are going to be over 50 degrees for maybe 50% 50, 50 of the year. So we are talking about a catastrophic transition in our climate that will change the nature of how we live and operate. And one of the things that I think is worth recognizing is what are the underlying issues behind it. 
and underlying issues that are driving some of this stuff. And I'm going to pull a little bit out on, onto that. Now, things I want you to focus on, bureaucracy, right? So how we measure, how we organize, how we administer is actually fundamental to the nature of the city, right? So whether it's 1066 and the first kind of doomsday book or whatever, all these things, these were compilations of organization. Our modern nation state is a function of the, of the Kaiser um, and how he, he organized the nation state through bureaucratic means. Our governance technologies are a function of bureaucracy. Our accounting mechanisms similarly. So a tree, let me just make this very real for you. A tree is, a, is what? Is a cost on the balance sheet of the city, which is why Sheffield City Council was cutting down mature trees because mature trees cost the most to maintain and the highest risk in terms of insurance. But unfortunately, when do you think trees give their best and most optimum environmental services in terms of CO2 sequestration, sustainable urban drainage? It's when they're mature, 40 years plus. So because the accounting mechanism of trees sees them as a cost, you optimize, you discount all the environmental services that they provide, and you look at the cost liabilities. And what that means is that that financial norm sets out many of these things. So, it's going to be more than five. So one of the hypotheses I want to put forward to you, so that's kind of a macro level stuff, and I'm going to bring this, start to bring this down into some uh, activations. So one of the things I would like to put forward to you is that our bureaucracy constructed the nature of our economy. So the reason why we have private economy is because the most efficient way of making contract between people is between me and you. Two bilateral contracts. It's the most efficient mechanism. When technology changes the nature of how we construct a contract, something fundamentally new happens. I can suddenly go into contract with everyone in this room. Efficiently. What happens when the nature of contracting isn't about a series of bilateral relationships, but genuinely multilateralism in a structural sense, a contractual level? I think the nature of where value occurs changes. Hypothesis. Now watch where I prove it. How do you know the highlight? Right? All you should know the highlight, right? So the High Line cost about $278 million to build, right? $278 million. Out of that $278 million, 70% of it was funded by federal and state, 25% of it was funded by uh, philanthropy, and 5% by citizens, approximately. Right? Here's a key question I'm going to ask you. 278 million, some of you know, so you shouldn't answer. 278 million, how many years would it have taken to pay for the 278 million if you took 10% of the land value uplift attributable to the High Line? 10% of the land value, the land value went up, around the High Line, if you just took 10% of the land value uplift and you used it to pay for the High Line, how many years do you think it would have taken to pay for it? I think it's quick. Give us a number. A year. Five. Five years. One month. One month. Ten. Tens. Years? A day. A day? Ten, what did you say? Ten years, right. It's about ten months. 10 months, right? And why that's important is that what this starts to prove is that effectively, a private, so civic goods create private value. 
aspects of the investment that went into the High Line lifted private property adjacent to it so significantly. And remember, in that calculation, we discounted all of Manhattan's increase, we discounted all the abnormalities, we just looked at what was attributable to that period. Now, why that's interesting is it starts to challenge an underlying thesis, which is where does the value, where does the value of property come from? If you own a piece of property, say this, this thing here, it's worth a lot of money, right? If I was to take this and put this in the middle of Nova Scotia, <laughs> I like Nova Scotia, what would it be worth? than construction costs, definitely, I think, now. So why is that? Because it's not attracted by other buildings around it. Precisely. So the, the value of something like this is a function, function, not totally, it's a function of its, here's a key word, monopolistic relationship to common and shared goods monopolistic relationship to common and shared goods. So, why do I say that? So, access to the High Line and people going there lifted the private property up. Historically, private property, if you owned a farm, the value of its farm was from the agriculture, the value of the soil and what it was contributing. In the 21st century city, the value of property is a function totally, but it's a function of its access rights that it provides. So what that shows us is that there is a different form of valuation required in cities and our places. And why the Highline example is critical, so if a school, an outstanding state school in the UK, puts between 70 to 100,000 pounds on a price of a house, state school. So an outstanding state school puts that money on all the houses that have privileged access to it. A park puts between seven to 10,000 pounds on a house and it's larger than the block. A tree-lined street puts seven to 8,000 on every house. So here we know that common goods create spillovers in private value. Now why this gets interesting is if you can start to picture and collect that common goods and value, you can start to you can start to build new business models, new value models, new value models that invest in civic goods. So what would happen if you went to a school and you said, do you know what? We're gonna gift you two million on the basis that all the houses adjacent to it, should there be a property uplift as a result of your performance, you pay us back 10% of it. So not only does your child go to a great school, free, you also get most of the benefit of the uplift in property. Now why I'm saying that is that that fundamentally changes how we think about cities and how we invest in our cities. As designers, what are the projects we all end up doing? Common goods, civic goods, some form of civic goods, parks, la la, right? You end up designing these cultural institutions. I'm saying the business models of 21st century are going to value those cultural institutions and cultural investments. And we now have the bureaucratic infrastructure to do that. And that applies at many, many levels. So I'll, I'll open up another thesis. So New York is looking to invest 119 billion into building a protective seawall around New York. If that wall doesn't happen, what is the price and value of land in New York long term? <laughs> nothing, right? It tends towards nothing because it will be underwater. So what is that 119 billion unlocking? It's unlocking space and time value of that property. That property is now going to be worth something for 80 years whilst that wall is functional. So that 119 billion links to that property to give it space and time rights. Historically, we always think of property as being infinite. We don't treat it like a white good, i.e. it degrades in value. Whereas when you start to put in infrastructure, you start to have a completely linked relationship to those property rights.
So when you start to see these linkages, you construct value differently. So digitization of property rights allows us to be able to link these things and unlink these things in really radical formats. So when these property rights can be unbundled, what can you do? What can you do when you can build a, a house which we're doing, which is called a free house, which we'll announce soon. Uh, imagine a house which is self-sovereign, which has a mortgage, a perpetual mortgage. And if you want to live in it, you write, you buy the obligation to live in it. You say, I will, I will cover the perpetual mortgage. And uh, if somebody else wants to do it, you can take the more perpetual obligation. But over time, it becomes near free, because that perpetual mortgage over 100 years becomes near zero and the obligation becomes mere, mere micro. So what you start to realize is that new mechanisms are going to change our relationship of the house and our relationship to infrastructure like this. And what does that do to how we organize places becomes really critical. But simultaneously, lots of other things. We know, for example, housing is one of the, poor housing is the highest contributor to healthcare costs, one of the highest contributors. Yet the business model of housing is all designed around the buying and selling of housing and rent. So we did a piece of work where we looked at retrofitting uh, a housing strip in Milton Keynes. And it was about retrofitting and making, improving the energy performance. Where was the savings from the retrofit? It wasn't in energy saving or monetary savings, which we all, everyone thought the savings would be by the people who lived there. All the savings were in the NHS as a result of reduced pneumonia cases. So when you know value, this is what I'm trying to tell you, the value of your investment in retrofitting that house is linked to the NHS. It's not linked to the product. Yet everything we design, if you want to look at the value, you look at where the value flows. Now our historic models of investing in housing have always been linked to the tradable value of the house. So if you go to Blackpool, the houses are worth nothing. So why does urban regeneration doesn't really happen in Blackpool? Because there's no land value to uplift. But if you were to build the social costs which are owned by the state, billions of pounds a year, and invite that back to the table, you can build a completely new way of engaging the transformation of urban space because it's not dependent on land value, it's looking at social liabilities. What you will build won't be high-rise towers because you don't have to optimize land value. What you're optimizing is human value. So these underlying characteristics redesign the, all the biases that we think about urban renewal and all our procedures in that process. And this happens in, like in 2000, I think one, 2002, there's a brilliant project called Million Dollar Blocks, which looked at urban blocks costing a million dollars for, uh, for the state in terms of reoffending. So the cost of reoffending. These urban blocks, and they were like, well, how do we invest in these urban blocks? Because if you amortize back future million dollars every year, back to present day value, how much could you invest in that neighborhood to transform and reduce the cost of reoffending? Why that's important is when you start to think like that, you will give yourselves the freedom to create new value. <laughs> Otherwise, the only person that's gonna to talk to you is saying, what color housing would you like? It's pretty much as far as it gets these days. What color would you like to paint it? Whereas if you want to talk about, well, this is what reoffending costs are. If we built this housing in a cooperative format or we did live build with people and we built the economic development thesis, we would have this effects. Then you're in a completely different narrative. So architecture and economics of architecture has to be creatively joined, not ignored. And this goes back to, this is one of my f absolute favorite equations ever. Um, because it really goes back at the kind of thesis of architecture. And architecture design costs are about 10% of the capital costs of building a building. 10%. Right? That's all design fees. This can be 4%, can be 5%, but on general, if you look at the whole design team, it's somewhere there. Sometimes it can be 25%, depending on how small it is. But Typically, it's there. But look at the numbers. To maintain that building costs 1.5, more than 
the capital costs, right? Significantly more, just to maintain that building. To operationalize that building, i.e. the people, it's eight. So currently, all your design contracts are focused where? Your design contracts are focused on the one. So you optimize the one. However much you fight it, however much you dislike it, your whole contractual bias, and that's what I mean, contractual bias is about optimizing one. That construction and the trade of that construction to an end user. It's really important, the sale of that construction to an end user. How many of you know about PFI? PPP, PFI, some of you, right? So PFI was generally hated by architects. But they were wrong. Don't listen to them in a blank way. PFI, what was really important about PFI was that when you were designing into PFI, you were designing for a 20-year organism. So you weren't designing for trade. You were designing how would this building operationalize for 20 years. So you would not do painted skirtings. Why? Because every three years when you have to repaint them, you lose the utility of the room. You would not do painted doors. You wouldn't do it. You'd do natural wood doors. So you wouldn't use aluminum door handles. You wouldn't use air conditioning, not for the reasons that you think. It's not about the energy costs. It's actually about the maintenance cost of, it, of, of, uh, of air conditioning. So when you start to look at PFI, which looks at a 20-year life cost of, you know, of a building, you design differently. That moment in time, I've only taken you to 1.5. Maintenance and capital. Now, if you're focused on designing, optimizing your people, so this room when it's full, when we have juries here, right? How many parts per million do you think this room is in terms of CO2 levels? It's typically about 413 parts per million, normal. But you take a guess. About that. It'd be about 12 to 1500 parts per million. That, that's the level that you can go up to. And you can go up to 2000, but it's very rare. But you, what do you think that does? Well, it cognitively destroys you. Not just anecdotally, but just pretty factually. So if you want to design, design buildings, you maximize your oxygen levels. And you maximize them, there is almost 13 points IQ points difference. Measurable difference in cognitive capability to make decisions. So if you want to get to that eight, you're no longer optimizing the maintenance cost, you're optimizing the quality of oxygen in that air and the air pollution effects. Right? Do you see what I'm trying to... So first one, optimize the construction. Second one optimizes, actually, op actually focuses on optimizing the cost and operationalization of the building. The third one, the eight, optimizes the oxygen levels, the light levels in the building. But your contracts are only to one. PFI extended it to 1.5, which means the buildings we get are a function of our contractual relationships. You want to reinvent architecture? Reinvent the architectural contract. It's really as simple as that. Don't read Bernard Shum, you've got nothing against him, fine books. Don't read OMA. It is actually in the contractual relationships. You want to reinvent it. Right? And I think this is really and this is really important for us to understand. Second point. How long how long do I have? Is this just like one of those AA nights you just keep going? What is it? <laughs> so tell everyone goes home. Do you know how long? Um, a third. Sounds good. I'll just keep going. You guys, you guys make decisions. Um, second, from control to ennobling. The thesis of governance and control, I think you guys should 
think about. So our cities and sort of, uh, sort of lots of people did really interesting work around the thesis of control and governance. Why do we have planning? You know, obviously did the work. What's planning's role? So you all know about planning, right? Planning laws and stuff like that. Why do we have it? So if you look at the history, and it's really worth looking at the history and then worth looking at our friend's dissertations because I think they're all brilliant, it's really worth looking at because historically, the land and the relationship of land was to dealt with through nuisance laws, i.e. my house, your house. If there's a problem, we would negotiate through nuisance laws or we would negotiate through actually conflicts and take it straight through. Planning was a mechanism to reduce the friction of development in an industrial age. As cities became compact, it was a device, it was an organizational device that we could do to organize cities. It reduced the friction. So the rules, I would not have to negotiate directly with every one of you. There would be a simple set of rules to which I would allocate. So it allowed the development of cities in a very particular format. And that was because the friction costs of you and me having an argument and negotiation would be too much and would slow down the development of the city and people would either go for informal developments and bilateral agreements that break it apart. So planning was a mechanism to reduce the friction of development. What happens if our mechanism of planning itself, we can start to reinvent it? So why do we have zoning laws? We still, as Alistair rightly points out, we have laws, we have zoning classes, you know, you can have housing, um, you still have zoning classes for tanning factories. Why do we have them? We have them because they were historic uh, design things. They were designed to deal with conflict of use, i.e. tanning produces poisons in the water system, in the ground system, smells and other things, and it would be a mechanism to say, well, you can't put any factories near this place. What happens when suddenly I don't need to zone this stuff? and I can legislate it with real-time sensors. What happens if a store in Oxford Street has got a 3D printing factory built into it? Is it a retail store? Is it a product manufacturing store? What is it? So our thesis of governance of cities is about to change. And in that thesis, my question to you is, how do you organize stuff? How will we organize stuff in mach machine rule-based systems? How will we organize stuff in this economy? I think is really important. The future of planning will dictate the future of our cities. Will dictate how our cities develop. And I think there are Planning does not have to be about control. It can also be about ennobling and other mechanisms of design. And there's a lot of work that we're doing around reimagining new forms of regulation. So how many of you know about the world work of P. Andrews, of writing regulations as code? So what happens when you can write regulations as code? What happens if it can say you can operationalize a truck out there between the hours of nine to five and you can get use classes, uh, use license for that particular period in real time as you need it? What happens if the city becomes dynamic in terms of its allocation of use? What happens in any of these realities? Third point. This is some of the stuff we did around sort of hormone, uh, sort of uh, open desk stools and uh, other things. And one of the things we started to realize, exactly as we said, around ownership and models of uh, innovation, was that actually you had to unbundle these things and look at how you built the warranty infrastructure behind them. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to pick up a few points. Four which I think is really important, from competition to non-rivalous economics. Our thesis of, of economics has largely been driven through competition, but not everything is a competition device. So data, if you want to talk about urban data, how many, I assume most of you know about sidewalk labs, right? 
hand, as you know, about sidewalk lamps. Work. Do sidewalk lamps work, do you know? No? In Toronto, you should look it up if you get a chance. They're Google's, uh, they're Google's spin-off looking at the future of cities. And I think they're the most interesting practice, regardless of anything out there. Ignore every other architect. I'm not saying they're right, I just think they're the most provocative and challenging. And I think if you want to look at the future of urbanism, look at their work better than anyone else. It's a really good question, so we were having this conversation in Old Camden. Is, uh, so there's two aspects to that, to the preface. Sidewalk Lab are asking these questions. They're perhaps not asking in the right way, but they're asking these questions. I know of no other architect thinking about this, full stop. So that's why it's important to look at them. Second, I think you're right. I think um, augmented reality, as you're a specialist of spatial computing, is also going to challenge the nature of where rights exist. And one of the interesting things for me is that is data a private good, or is data effectively not? So data becomes more valuable the more it's earned by people. Uh, the, sorry, not the more people that, that have access to it. So the more people have access to it, the more valuable it becomes. Whereas if you turn it into a competitive resource, actually it becomes less and less valuable. So if I own my data and you own your data, if everyone owns their own data and there's no liquidity of data, it becomes actually marginal value. My individual value of data is next to nothing. Everyone who tells you, own your own data and trade it, it's utter bollocks, because it, it's a societal product. It's a product that exists at a societal level. I think that one of the fundamental challenges is societal products are getting owned by private organizations. Now, here it gets into the idea of corporate law. So one of the, I think, the most fundamental questions we're going to have is, is there an economy of private companies? Is there such a thing a private company? Or is, are all companies public companies with private financing? Which is a different way of looking at the problem. So it could turn around and say, actually, if you're working at a societal level, you're a full public good organization with private financing. So your obligation is to the public good and your law of tort to the public, public good, but you can still create profit. So I think we have to de-link governance from the mechanisms of uh, financing. I think that's going to be one of the first things we're going to see. And public utilities have tried to do that, but I think we're going to start to look at that. The other thing I think we're going to see is the cost of holding data will become very expensive, and it'll be the legal cost of holding data. I think we're going to see that's the way you end up driving some of the stuff back into good behavior, is the risks of holding data become significant. And then I think you're right, advertising law can be applied on, on augmented reality. So if you're, if you're saying you own not just the land, but the theoretical or the projection rights of that land and all the secondary rights, you can suddenly start to say, well, actually, if you're, I don't know, uh, Tamagotchi <laughs> sort of uh, walks into it. There's a cost, right? Um, so what happens? So th these things are all up for debate, and I think they're going to challenge. Um, they're going to challenge the nature of how we organise our urbanism. And I don't think we're having that conversation about about these how the augmented reality, spatial governance, uh, compliance mechanisms. How do you regulate that? How do you actually drive compliance into that? Forget about regulation. How do you com drive compliance in that? What level of control and influence do you have to have over the tech providers to be able to drive compliance? Is that level of control and regulation good? <laughs> um, 
uh, I would argue it's not good, actually. You don't want government having that much control over, over, over technolo technology prices, so you want to introduce different mechanisms of driving compliance, which I think should be driven by citizens being able to sue yeah. um, and empowering citizens to drive compliance rather than state, because I think there's a tyranny of state question in there. to like do anything. So I'm gonna, like if you, what is it, I, did, I made a mistake of looking at what my Google Nest was doing. I put a, a PyTorch on it just to see how much data Google's taking off of me, because they gave me this nice shiny present. I was like, ah, oh, this is cool. And then suddenly I'm like, oh my God, you guys are listening to everything. You're taking room temperature, humidity, what time they're logging when I'm cooking. Like, and they don't tell you that anything like that. And you're like, oh, I don't care, thanks, I'm okay with it. Like, I, like, wow, and that's what's, they're driving uh, revenue from that now, like that is a, that's like gold to them. Whereas Open Mind, which I think Google know they have to pivot, and that's why they're allowing the DeepMind researchers to put this out, they've got to build a new model where they can still train AI, but not take our data, or not need our data even. Um, so I think there's a, there's a, th there's a conversation there someone should have, and especially when it, gets, uh, when it gets back into my spatial world, I'm going to need that data again, and I'm going to also invade your boundaries currently. Like, I can leave a Pokemon in that garden, and I don't need to ask anyone's permission, but I can already play a game on that square, but I can't play the game anywhere else, so I'm already spokely doing that, because there's a thing, I already know that world, I can only do it on that world. But no one permission for that, like, like the same way I'd have to ask for a bar to be there. Um, so I think that's an interesting kind of, I don't know, something, someone should do something with it. I'm going to be a typical engineer developer, just go straight down the thing and just ship every day, keep building, and then worry about when someone puts the handcuffs on. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think what's interesting is that is also the kind of predictive idea of the city. So if you look at any of this stuff, how valuable is it? So I would also recommend really good people like Nassim Taleb. So he talks about anything that is predictable is actually low value. Um, he talks about the kind of, in a way, the unpredictability, the kind of anti-fragile resistance is where the value is. So I also think some of the kind of machine learning thesis is maybe commodifying a lot of stuff, but actually the value formation will operationalize differently, which will be really interesting. So I'm gonna try to bring this so we can have a nice discussion as well. So there's lots of stuff around uh, regulatory innovation, which I think you, should, you guys should all be looking at. So mechanism. Um, savvy, what's the first or like AIDS? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we look at sort of regulatory innovation, I think that's gonna be one of the most interesting things you should look at. How do we govern what property rights and I'll go all the way through to licensing mechanisms, all these things are gonna come up. Second, I'm gonna, I think this is important because I think this also changes our frame of thinking. This is again, of some work we're doing in Stockholm, but what it talks about is that lots of, this is in the health space, but I think you'll see the relevance. In the health space, most of the effort is focused on treatment. About 2% is focused on prevention. The reason why 2% is focused on prevention and only 2% is because of actually how government accounting works. Government accounting doesn't look at future costs and liabilities. So if you want to do prevention, you have to change government accounting mechanisms. Secondly, none of our legal infrastructure, i.e. doctors don't know how to prescribe prevention, we don't have a nice pre 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 preventive 
preventive activity. Our data infrastructure isn't there for preventive interventions yet. All the way through just doesn't exist. And the second point is prevention doesn't only exist at the individual level. It exists at the level of you and your social networks and your environmental con conditions. Air pollution, soil pollution, all these things have become really critical. And it also exists at the deep code level. So well, imagine that uh, an architect prescribing to place. Just run that scenario. You want to, you are an architect and you prescribe the symptoms of that place. So if you want to do deep prevention work, that is what you would be doing. You'd be prescribing to the environmental conditions for that space to change the outcomes for all the people in that environment. So if you look at a deep preventative economy, you would have a doctor, a community activist, and an architect working together as your core team because you would operationalize value in different formats. And again, these sort of experiments, what you start to very quickly realize is that you don't just have one intervention. If you want to shift the mental health space, that's the scale of portfolios. That's the portfolios that we're, we're operationalizing in Stockholm. So you realize your organizing principles change, but they are innovation in the policy regulatory space, in the accountancy space, as well as there's innovations in a super quiet zone on the other side. So only by changing the regulatory accounting mechanisms and the public to public contractual mechanisms can you do the super quiet zone. And I think this is really important for us to realize. So we can always dream the interventions, but we don't look back as to underlying structures which are stopping them happening. So these things are really critical. So in terms of kind of the boring stuff, I really think we should just keep an eye on future of rights, property rights and all those infrastructures. And I think if you want a provocation, here's a kind of provocation to warm us up a little bit. Ownership is the enslavement of a thing to your utility. Ownership is the enslavement of a thing to your utility. We got rid of owning other human beings, yet we still own land to a degree. We still own land and we enslave land for our utility. Yet land has lots of system benefits, bees and other things, which are largely ignored and reduced and destroyed. So what is a new model of relationship that we could articulate with land? And historically, there are treaties with land. You can have a treaty or a relationship with land in a different format. There's some radical work that's going to happen around that, which I think will be really interesting. Future of policy, future of contracting, I've already told you. If we go to a, from a private economy to a civic economy, there's a whole shift in how value formation occurs. Future of licensing, how we give permission in a real-time mechanism. Together, these things change our city at a structural level. And finally, perhaps to end, I also think it's worth just looking at what it means to be human. Our thesis of being human is, is still locked into a, a kind of a quasi-individualistic modular man thesis. Yet the reality is that as a human, you are not a singular individual. Uh, we know that in terms of whether you look at uh, uh, epigenetics, the history of poverty, the impacts of poverty past three generations. We know in terms of your brain, your peer group affects your, your, your actual cognitive performance. We know that actually, whether it's in terms of identity formation or whether phys physiologically, you are not one organism, you are a multitude of organisms. We know that microbiomes affect your cognitive performance. We know that the idea of the definitive human is a really interesting but not accurate description of what it means to be human. So how do we recognize the fact that we're highly contextual interdependent systems? And the best description, and I haven't been able to manifest this in a kind of thesis, but the best description I've had is that humans are like a wave on an ocean, i.e., where does the wave end? And humans are the intelligence system of the Earth. So it makes us indivisible from the ocean itself. So what does that do to the human condition? And why I ask that question is I think when you start to 
ask the question of what it means to be human in the 21st century, you will see it's relational. And in that relational aspect, there's a new type of economy and society being formed. And if you look back at all the thesis of bureaucracy, what we're seeing is our mechanisms of organizing are becoming increasingly linked, and that mirrors a thesis of how we understand how it means to be human. And this is a paradigm shift. That is a paradigm shift in the bureaucracy of how we contract and organize mirrors a new thesis of what it means to be human. And that thesis operates epigenetics, scarcity, so, you know, uh, sort of, uh, if you're financially uh, in difficulty, it inhibits your decision making, your IQ levels, all of these things deteriorate to everyone. Everyone. So if I put you in persistent systems, you know, gut mood effects, uh, gut influences your mood, emotional impacts, emotional violence, what it does to you, and your cognitive performance, all the way to racism, right? So we know, for example, this is a brilliant work from Rob, uh, Dr. Robert Williams, who looked at why Afro-Americans were dying 10 years in advance of their peers. And what he found equivalent, so equally educated, and what he found was this was a function of micro-violence. And the violence was actually small acts of everyday racism they were facing meant there was a persistently high levels of cortisone in their bloodstream, which means they were more susceptible to heart disease, more susceptible to diabetes, and other issues. 10 years was being taken off. So this micro-violence of our cities is actually destroying, taking 10 years of people's lives. So when you reframe our relationship for what it means to be human and healthy and human development, what does that do to our cities and how we relate to each other? That, I think, is a foundational issue. So, and, you know, loneliness is equivalent of having 15 cigarettes a day. 15 cigarettes. So all of these things, I suppose I wanted to just talk about the future of architecture isn't going to be defined by form finding. It's going to be defined by actually the transition in these deep underlying structures. And they are now being reimagined because the science of understanding human is way in advance of all the policy. Even if you looked at quantum physics, the philosophy of quantum physics in the 70s was way in advance of most of the science had got to. So the science of what it means to be human, the technology of what it means to, to, to organize our bureaucracy and administration are transforming our world. Those two forces will transform what it means to organize and how our cities will be formed. So if you want to look at the revolution of architecture, it is those two forces which change it. That, to me, is, I think, the boring revolution in architecture, but it's also the real revolution. And the question for me is, are we equipped to be talking about it, designing it, and thinking about it? So if you want to inv invest, that's where I'd do it. With that, thank you.